know if this ultrasonic sensor would be right for you as contained in the data sheet. When a customer is choosing a, a ultrasonic sensor, probably the first thing he's going to ask or want to know is what's the sensing range? If you're a sensor, you know, if you're looking for a sensor, you want to know how far away could it detect a product. And uh, the sensing range, there's, there's two different uh, specifications that involve the sensing range. One is the actual sensing range, which is the maximum usable sensing area. And the next is the adjustment range, which is our maximum recommended sensing limits. So for this UB800 model, uh, if you look at the sensing range is actually 50 to 800, but the adjustment range that we recommend is 70 to 800. And we do that because 50 is the near limit. If you get any closer than 50 millimeters to the transducer, you penetrate what is called the unusable area. And in that area, uh, you can have some instabilities to your output. So we recommend that you get a little further away for your, for your near distance so that you don't get into that area and have any stability issues. And we'll talk about the unusable area next. The unusable area is also called by some manufacturers uh, the dead band or the blind zone, but it's an area where target placement or sensor programming is not allowed. The output can be unpredictable in this window, and what happens is, uh, the way the sensor works, it sends out an ultrasonic pulse, and it waits for it to come back, uh, and, what, and there's a ringing involved. And that sensor needs to stop ringing, the transducer needs to stop ringing so it can accurately hear the echo return. And if you're too close, the sensor transducer is still vibrating, and it's going to have some stability issues and not be able to hear that echo pulse return. So here's kind of a graphical illustration and maybe a, a oscilloscope illustration of what's going on when an ultrasonic sensor is, uh, transducer is struck and creates its uh, evaluation pulse. Uh, the pulse, is, the transducer, as I mentioned in the previous slide, must settle before it receives an echo. So you have that area where it's just really too close. The sound comes out, hits a target, comes back to the transducer while it's still ringing, and it can't, uh, it can't determine what's going on because it needs to settle before it can listen. It is the user's responsibility to configure the sensor within the correct limits. Uh, the sensor won't know if you're in the blind zone or not because it's still ringing. It has no idea what's going on. Now, you can get multiple echoes where the, the sound pulse goes from the transducer to the target, back to the transducer, back to the target, and back. And in that period of time, the... Uh, the transducer will have finally settled down and it thinks the target's twice as far away as, as it really is. Uh, so the sensor doesn't know. If it's in the blind zone, all bets are off. So the customer must know there's just no way that he should uh, be banking on using that blind zone area for his detection. You've got to be from the end of the blind zone out. And with the through beam model, so we were discussing a diffused model before, there is very much a minimal blind zone uh, because now you have a dedicated emitter and a dedicated receiver. So it's constantly, the emitter's constantly sending out, the receiver is constantly listening. Uh, and that allows the, for a very small, if, if non existent, dead band. So you can see here uh, you've got a one meter, a thousand millimeter sensing range, but you can put these as close as 15 millimeters apart and still have a, a nice strong signal between them with no issues as far as uh, ringing and multiple reflections and things. Uh, you can also see here the switching frequency of an ultrasonic through beam here is a thousand hertz for this model. Uh, if you were to have the equivalent model for a diffused version it would probably be around 10 hertz or 15 hertz. So you can see by not having to wait for that emitter transducer to settle and listen, you can go a lot faster. It's a, co a continuous stream of sending and receiving. Uh, so it's this through beam ultrasonic or the through beam mode is the fastest available response time for ultrasonic sensors. The next topic to discuss is the beam angle. Uh, just like as if you were to talk, your voice kind of fills the entire room as you speak. Uh, ultrasonic sensors are also using sound, so their sound expands out 
in kind of a conical shape uh, once that transducer is struck and the evaluation pulse is created. So that's something to keep in mind is that it's not like a laser beam, that the sound does come out in a wider area and you have a, a wider area of coverage for ultrasonics. And this, uh, this beam angle is specified in Pepperell and Fuchs data sheets. Okay, here's a screen capture the, of a characteristic response curve that's found in any ultrasonic sensors data sheet. And you can see that the beam angle is going to be dependent upon the target. So you've got uh, curve number one or area coverage number one <coughs> and area coverage number two. Number one is a 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter flat plate. So a very four inch square wide plate. Uh, this curve two is in response to a 25 millimeter or a one inch diameter uh, rod or round bar. So you can see if it's a flat plate, you can see, you can detect it much further away and in a much wider area than if it's a rounded target which, which is much less reflective and also it's smaller. So the beam angle is dependent upon the target size, the contour, whether it's flat and much more reflective or round where some of the sound disperses when it hits and doesn't come straight back to the sensor. It's dependent upon the alignment, you know, how perpendicular it is to the target. And also the density, if it's something soft like a felt or a foam or something, it's going to be much more difficult to detect than if it's a nice hard acoustically reflective uh, part. And uh, also of note is sometimes the beam angle can be customized by software or by configuration wires. And that's something uh, when we talk about software customization, we'll be covering that a little bit in our intermediate and advanced classes. That's not something we're going to cover in depth in the uh, basic classes. We're going to discuss the beam angle and the uh, target relationship a little more in detail on this particular slide. Um, highly reflective targets can be detected quite a ways beyond what the nominal specification is in our catalog. So uh, a UB800, for example, which is what this technical data screenshot is taken from, you would think it could only go to 800 millimeters, but if the target's reflective enough, like this 100 by 100 uh, or 4 inch square flat plate, you could actually see that plate out to 1200 millimeters with no problems. Uh, so there's a little excess gain built into ultrasonic sensor specifications. And you should be aware that a lot of competitors uh, will not allow for this excess gain. They'll, they'll specify their sensor at the absolute maximum distance. So if you're doing a cross-reference for ultrasonic sensors versus one of our competitors, uh, make sure that you look at their beam chart to see if their version of a UB800 really maximum is 800 or if it goes out to 1200. Uh, sometimes the cross-references can be a little tricky because of the way different manufacturers uh, specify their sensing ranges. Okay, we've talked a little bit about the specific uh, standard targets that are used to measure an ultrasonic uh, sensing range, uh, one inch diameter rod and the 100 by 100 millimeter square um, metal plate. But uh, in general, in real life, you aren't going to be using those targets. You're going to be using whatever, whatever you want to sense. So the best targets, as far as quality goes, are objects with a high density. Um, so anything solid, uh, liquids, granulars like rocks, like corn, uh, whatever, like uh, just things with a high density. And whether the target is perpendicular, uh, that's obviously the best. You're getting the maximum sound back from your for your echo, and also uh, rougher targets. As odd as that sounds, uh, the rough targets, if you angle them left or right, you can get a lot wider sensing beam angle, and you don't have that issue where you have uh, the sound deflecting off a smooth surface and an angle and not coming back to the sensor. So when that surface is rough. Uh, you still have some little corner cubes. It's kind of like bouncing a, a ball off the ground and into a wall and it comes back to you. When you have uh, the rougher surfaces, you have a lot more of those corner cubes and it's a, it's a lot better target than a very smooth, like a mirror or a, a smooth metal plate. Poor targets, uh, felt, cloth, foam rubber, frothy liquids, all of those absorb sound. 
So if you uh, want a good reflective echo to come back, you want something that's going to reflect the sound very well. And soft, soft targets, fluffy targets, cloth, things like that uh, are not the best. It's not to say you can't detect them, uh, but you've probably got to be quite a bit closer than you would something of a higher density. Uh, smooth and angled targets I mentioned before, uh, they can be detected, but uh, again, you've either got to be a lot closer or you've got to make sure that you've got a perpendicular axis for your detection. And then very high surface temperatures. Uh, if you're looking at steel, molten steel, things like that, uh, ultrasonics, that, that heat, that radiant heat that comes off of the, uh, the product will diffuse the, so the uh, sound waves and pretty much render the, sense, uh, the product undetectable for diffuse mode. Through beam mode, it wouldn't matter. This slide illustrates what I spoke of on the previous slide regarding the angle that you uh, can get away with when looking at a smooth target. Um, ideally, the target's going to be perpendicular, uh, but that's not always possible in real life. Uh, so we'll allow up to a plus minus three degree target variance, uh, left or right, up and down, doesn't matter, where the target is still going to be detectable if the surface is like a mirror, like a glass, something very smooth. Uh, you can go beyond that to 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees if, it, if it's a rougher surface. Um, but the sound will, as you can see from the graphic with the incident ray and the reflected ray, if you're at a 45 degree angle, none of the sound on a smooth surface is going to come back. It's all going to be reflected off the other way and the target would essentially be invisible. An application where this wider beam from an ultrasonic uh, might be helpful is in uh, uh, overhead conveyors for collision avoidance uh, because photoize, photoize uh, one, one area where photoize are sometimes used here is where you have the photoize and then the reflector and as long as you keep a reflector and the photoize in a nice visual line you know a nice linear line it's no problem uh, you can see the, the reflector would be on the product in front and the emitter on the product behind it and as long as they meet, then you know everything's going to be okay and you're not going to collide. You know, you can gauge the distance that way. Um, but the problem with that is as you make a turn, uh, that reflector is not going to give you a good, uh, good um, return path for your, for your light. With the wider beam ultrasonic, and if you use like a rougher surface, like a like sandpaper, like some kind of the, the no-stick flooring that's used sometimes, it's very rough, or no-slip flooring, I should say. When you turn the corner, you get that 30, 40 degree plus minus that you have still no problems in uh, maintaining the separation from vehicle to vehicle or device to device um, because you get that uh, nice acoustic feedback from, from a rougher reflector. So it's nice to have that. Also, the, the, you don't care about the color. So if you're looking even at a car surface or something like that, clear color, uh, black, white, doesn't matter with ultrasonics. Uh, an application tip, if I'll throw one out here, is that clear glass detection is a great uh, application for ultrasonic sensors that photo eyes really tend to struggle with. So that's something to, to keep, uh, you know, keep in mind with uh, some companies and in the automotives, we'll use the ultrasonic to adjust the window, uh, moving it back and forth to make sure it's aligned during production so it seals nice. A little earlier in the presentation, we discussed response time of ultrasonic sensors and that they were a little bit slower than a photo eye or a little bit slower than inductives. If you look in the technical data sheet, uh, you'll see a response delay specified for an ultrasonic. And this 800 millimeter range model you can see is about 100 milliseconds. Now that 100 milliseconds, what that tells you is the elapsed time from the sensor's pulse being emitted and the effect of its information that it gets returned on the output. So there's a little bit of a delay, it sends out its pulse, and then <clears throat> internal to the sensor, uh, what, is, what it's really doing is it's probably going to take like four or five different pulses successive, one, two, three, four, five, and it's going to average them. So that way you get kind of a, your output doesn't jump up and down as it gets each echo back. Uh, it kind of averages 
those five out and then gives you the output and that makes for a very smooth stable output so that's another reason why uh, an inductive sensor or a photo eye might have a one or a two millisecond response time and the ultrasonic is going to have a hundred it's because it's taking multiple pulses averaging them out and then it's triggering the output to do whether it's analog switch point uh, you know wh whatever the type of sensor is one of the reasons an ultrasonic might use this averaging function is to improve the stability so if you're looking at perhaps an agitated tank of whatever water um, beer could be you know whatever might be inside a tank cleaning solutions uh, you're going to get peaks and valleys because that surface is going up and down but you don't want your output to you just want to basically know the average of the output you don't want to know the peak and valley of every little wave and ripple uh, so that's one of the reasons why an ultrasonic sensor will average a series of echoes and then provide an output it's to make a, make for a smoother output in instances like level control uh, there's also some different you can uh, through software you can increase or decrease the amount of samplings that are taken to get a quicker response time or if it's a very agitated tank or agitated surface uh, a longer sampling to smooth out an even more severe agitation so again we will probably in the intermediate and advanced sessions discuss how you can do that uh, through computers um, but something to keep in mind if a sensor that's off the shelf is a little too unstable for a customer uh, you have the ability through software to customize the response time and also uh, sometimes even without software uh, there are some methods to smooth out uh, instabilities and one is a stilling tube where you can put the sensor inside a tube and you can see that graphic on the bottom right uh, where it's kind of like a nice tranquil little island inside the tube uh, because there's no waves in, in there that the waves are on the outside but the, the tube kind of stills everything so stilling tubes are one method to uh, to get rid of widely deviating or fluctuating outputs due to an agitated surface customers are always going to be concerned with the accuracy of an ultrasonic product that's one of the questions that comes up very uh, very frequently and accuracy is the degree of overall correctness and precision of your device so how close are you to being you know if, if a target is uh, 10 inches away how accurate is your sensor going to be is it going to say it's exactly 10 might it be 10.1 might it be 9.5 uh, that all depends on the accuracy and the accuracy is not a single factor it's a combination of typically with ultrasonics three factors uh, the resolution the linearity and the repeatability and you can see in this highlighted excerpt uh, from a data sheet below you can see the resolution uh, the deviation from the characteristic curve which is a uh, an analog thing and then the repeatability or the repeat accuracy so all those three components go together to create the accuracy spec uh, the next two concepts to discuss with ultrasonics as far as uh, somewhat components of accuracy are the resolution and the repeatability uh, with resolution resolution defines the smallest positional change that a sensor could recognize so you can see on the graphic on the right uh, or the two graphics on the right for low resolution you get blocks and you get a very blocky image and that same kind of concept applies to an ultrasonic sensor where maybe if you have a an analog output that is 4 to 20 milliamps if you have a 1 milliamp resolution you would go 1 milliamp and then you'd move until it jumps up to two or I'm sorry if you went four milliamps it would jump up to five and then five jumps up to six if you have a higher resolution then you can go four to four point one four point one to four point two four point two to four point three etc uh, so that's the difference in resolution you get a much finer look the better the resolution is for a given product now repeatability uh, that's a little different uh, the repeatability is the ability to reproduce a given result so if you go one time out to a, a target that's 10 inches away it tells you 10 inches the next time you go out it says 10.1 uh, then there's a 0.1 inch repeatability difference or plus minus 0 0.5 inches so you can look at the spec of the in the 
the data sheet and see that repeat accuracy or repeatability and find out from uh, measurement to measurement how much you can vary. And uh, the big component that makes that vary for an ultrasonic sensor is temperature change uh, because the speed of sound is temperature dependent. And some of the sensors will have a, a, a temperature compensation network that senses the ambient temperature and allows you a, a much greater um, degree of accuracy because it, it's always giving the sensor feedback to the, out, the outside temperature. Some sensors that are very low end don't have that. Uh, but keep in mind then, repeatability, <coughs> repeatability is a component of uh, primarily temperature changes. I'd mentioned before that uh, temperature will affect the speed of sound. Uh, so let's look at a few of the other environmental influences that might affect the speed of sound. And uh, this is important to know because you know these sensors are not always applied indoors in a nice climate controlled factory. In fact, some of our largest customers uh, are agricultural customers who use these things on uh, crop sprayers and and things like that. So they are used outdoors. Uh, rain and snowfall in moderate amounts does not have any effect on an ultrasonic sensor's operation. Heavy rain, heavy snowfall, uh, yes, that will affect uh, an ultrasonic. Likewise, wind, uh, moderate amounts of wind have no effect on ultrasonic sensor's operation. But, uh, you know, I would not put them in a hurricane. The echo is going to get uh, blown away and, and the sensor will never see it. So uh, moderate amounts of wind, uh, no problem for an ultrasonic sensor. And also ambient noise. Now, back in the old days, in the early days of ultrasonic sensors, uh, some of our competitors had uh, little shiny metal transducers that you could jingle your car keys around or blow an air hose by, and they would immediately affect the output of a sensor. Uh, so some people, I think, if, if you've been around a long time, maybe they gave up on ultrasonics because of those problems. Uh, that's not really the case with our Pepperell and Fuchs ultrasonics. So those have a extremely high immunity to any kind of audible noise. They're on a different frequency and it's coded. Uh, the, you know, the sound is coded, so it's very difficult to have any effect, uh, regardless of the decibel level, uh, for ambient noise to affect our ultrasonics. Uh, a little more on environmental influences, humidity. Uh, general outdoor humidity uh, is not going to be a problem for any kind of ultrasonic sensor. Uh, the speed of sound may change a little bit, so your repeatability may change. Uh, but in general, these things are used outdoors all the time, so it's not really a, a too big of an effect. But if you're in a constantly steamy or constantly high humidity uh, environment, uh, that could be an issue. So you need the if the sensor is exposed and over the course of a day gets its chance to dry out or two days, um, you're not going to have a problem. But if you have like a steamy hot liquid and you have an ultrasonic that's constantly exposed to those vapors, uh, that could be a problem over time. Uh, dust and dirt, there's no effect. So you can see uh, this agricultural machine on the top right corner. You almost can't see it through all the dust and dirt. Uh, but for the ground level that needed to be sensed on that machine, it's no problem at all. It's very, very accurate. And uh, ambient temperature changes, I uh, mentioned that before, changes in air temperature will affect the speed of sound and subsequently also affect the, uh, the accuracy of your sensor a little bit. Here's a simple uh, graphic that shows the temperature drift and uh, the effects of having or not having temperature compensation. And this would be for a UB1000 model uh, where the target would be at 1000 millimeters. You can see at 1000 millimeters and 68 degrees Fahrenheit, you get a 1000 millimeter output. Um, so that's, that's the sensor knows exactly where the target's at. With the temperature compensation, uh, you can still have a variance of about plus or minus one and a half percent. So it could go down to 985, could go up to 1,015. And that's more a, a component of the lag uh, because the temperature compensation element is inside the sensor. So the outside temperature may change a little bit. And then the, the response of the sensor for compensating for that uh, may lag a little bit just because it's, it's kind of buried inside the sensor a little. Um, you can also see here that as the temperature drops, 
the speed of sound slows down. So at minus 13 Fahrenheit on an uncompensated sensor, since the speed of sound slows down, the sensor thinks the target might be further away. So there, um, where the deviance on an uncompensated sensor might be up to plus or minus 8.5% from the 1,000 millimeters, uh, if the temperature is minus 13, it could conceivably think that this, the target is 1,077 millimeters away. If the environment is extremely hot, like 158 Fahrenheit, the speed of sound goes quicker. So the sensor thinks the target might be closer. So in that instance, 1,000 millimeters away, uh, the sensor may think that the target's really 915 millimeters. But keep in mind, you know, this is extremely worst case where we're, you know, not too many areas go down to minus 13 Fahrenheit and up to 158 Fahrenheit. And also keep in mind that most of our sensors are temperature compensated, so we're in that smaller window and not, not the wider window. Okay, now we're moving along to the model and attribute overview. We know, we know now the technology, we know about accuracy and temperature and uh, all that kind of stuff. Now we're going to move into the models themselves, the, you know, some of the more popular selling families of ultrasonic sensors that Pepperell and Fuchs offers. The two basic uh, primary output types for ultrasonic sensors there's switch point output, which is basic. Is the box there? Is the box not there? Is the level too high? You know, is the level low? And a lot of our sensors will have single or dual switch point outputs. So that's really the proximity mode. Uh, works just like a proximity sensor. It's is the target there? Is the target not there? Uh, equally as popular for ultrasonics is the analog type. And here you get continuous feedback. So it's not just is the target there, is the target not there. It's giving you an increment how close. Is it 4 millimeters away, 5 millimeters away, 6 millimeters away. So you get a continuous feedback. And that's either uh, in an analog uh, 4 to 20 milliamp or 0 to 10 volt output. And that can also be inverted. So some customers like it 20 to 4 and 10 to 0. You can do that as well. So we've discussed the UB300 and the UB1000, the UB800. So we're talking about all these different uh, sensing ranges that are available. Uh, but size does matter for an ultrasonic transducer. So the bigger the drum, the more power, the further you can, uh, you can see a target. And the smaller, likewise, the smaller is going to be a smaller beam angle, higher frequency, uh, and you've got to be a little bit closer in order to see the target. Okay, we're going to work our way up from cylindrical to surface mount and also from the smallest diameter to the largest diameter. So the first model I'm going to quickly highlight is the 12 millimeter diameter cylindrical version. And these models can be programmed either by a teach wire where you touch the voltage to a plus or the minus when your target's at a given point and it stores it, or there's a push button programmer. Uh, that you can plug into your power supply and thread into the back of the sensor and you can push the buttons to learn the distances. Uh, the different models available are there's a 120 millimeter, a 200 millimeter, and then a 400 millimeter maximum sensing range version. And you get your analog current and voltage outputs as well as a PNP type. So you can take your pick of those three, which one you prefer. So moving up from our 12 millimeter diameter family to the 18 millimeter family, uh, this is our half pint series. And we call it half pint because it's probably about half the size of the uh, longer barrel model that we'll see in the next slide. So we've got a 40 millimeter barrel length, roughly the length of a matchstick. And you can go 300 millimeters and 800 millimeters. So by using that uh, uh, longer range version now you can go with 800 longer than you could with any 12 millimeter model so again the bigger the drum the more distance you get uh, there's a through beam option there's analog current and voltage options and it's also nice you can see that the LEDs on this model are super big and super bright so those can be something that customers uh, really enjoy when they're doing their their setup now we can take a look at the long barrel 18 millimeter diameter series it's got a 75 millimeter barrel length as opposed to the 40 millimeter, uh, but sometimes that's helpful. Sometimes, you know, customers enjoy having a lot of extra mounting threads available. And in ultrasonic applications, 
a lot of times you have some space because you're looking at a target that's could be one feet, two feet, you know, 34 feet away. Not for this uh, model, obviously, uh, but the mounting size of the uh, the the uh, transducer is sometimes not as critical, or oftentimes not as critical as it is for for different sensors like capacitive or inductive. Uh, but moving on, uh, again, this uh, longer barrel 18 millimeter diameter series, same outputs as we've discussed before uh, with analog and switch point, but it's also got a selectable beam width, which can be nice. So by taking the uh, the teach input for the beam selector, you can make for a wide beam or a skinny beam. So you can customize this sensor without the use of software for applications where you might need something uh, you know, with a beam that's a little tighter or a little wider. If a customer does need a maximum range in a uh, smaller space, you know, it's a kind of a general rule that ultrasonics don't really have the space restrictions that a, an inductive needs, but it can certainly happen. So if you need high functionality and high power, uh, we have remote transducers where the transducer element is all that's in the circular housing. And then maybe one meter away, you have the elect driver electronics mounted. So you can put that tiny little sensing head in a lot of space restrictive applications and then have the driver electronics uh, located you know, a yard away or three feet away. Uh, so it g gives you some options that you couldn't get otherwise in the smaller barrel like the half pint size. Now you have software configurability, synchronization inputs. Uh, you can do a lot of things with these because you have so much uh, microprocessor power inside that bigger barrel than you could get in a smaller one. So you get maximum performance and intelligence, but in the mini miniature design. Okay, this is kind of important to note that our 30 millimeter diameter plug programmable versions, if you're familiar with those, uh, they have a, a socket in the back and a small plug that you could rotate and you learn uh, maybe one switch point and the end of your switch points to make a window or the 4 milliamp and 20 milliamp uh, components of an analog span. Uh, that family PNF has offered for probably over 15 years and it is going to be obsoleted in favor of two new families. Uh, but it's not going to go away very quick and I'm sure we'll keep it around for the next three, five years because there's such an installed base of it and it's been a very popular series. Um, so just something to keep in mind. I'm going to promote the next two families as the future uh, but this one that you may be familiar with if you've sold PNF for a little bit, uh, if not, it's going to be around for the next several years, um, but will ultimately be replaced by the next two models. The first model that's going to replace the old plug series is our Series I.O. And it has the identical sensing ranges as the plug versions, and I'll run those because I haven't discussed those yet. Uh, run those past you is 500 millimeter, two, four, and six meter, six meter being roughly 20 feet, uh, nominal sensing ranges. And these are kind of neat because instead of that plug that sometimes, you know, if you're above a tank and you're plugging in your sensing range to learn your limits, you drop the plug in the tank, it, you know, some, I would say a lot of people don't like that. Uh, these give you the same functionality, but with a push button. So they're very well sealed. There's no plug to come loose or fall off or drop. Uh, so that's the big feature of this product uh, that will be a successor to the plug type is it's all push button, nice membrane type push buttons that are very well sealed to the environment. Um, they are configured either by the buttons or if you want to go with the software, there's a program called Pactware that, uh, again, if you take the intermediate and the advanced classes, you'll learn all about that. Uh, but you can do probably 90% of what you need with the buttons and you don't need the software whatsoever. Uh, it's a nice product because they have push-pull outputs for switch points. Push-pull means they're NPN and PNP. So you don't need to stock two different models if somebody wants an NPN and somebody wants a PNP. And then the analog models also are both current and voltage. So that's a nice feature that you don't have to stock separate current or voltage models and those ones also offer a switch point. And the LEDs on them are great. Uh, very high visibility LEDs, there's five of them. 
And finally, it is IO-Link compatible. And IO-Link is a uh, new sensor protocol, again, uh, an intermediate to advanced discussion to have on that. But if your customer asks you for an IO-Link compatible ultrasonic, now you've got a full family of them. So keep that in mind. The next family uh, that's kind of a parallel brother or sister to the uh, Series I.O. is the new Series 70, uh, which is going to be available in August of 2013. And this model is uh, similar in that you can see it's 500 millimeter, 2, 4, and 6 meter sensing ranges. Uh, so same as the uh, Series I.O., but it's, poten it's potentiometer configurable. So it's got a little, uh, you know, screwdriver twist is all it takes to adjust the sensing range as opposed to a button. So it's a little simpler in that respect. Um, you don't need to learn about holding buttons for a certain period of time and looking at LEDs blinking to toggle through modes. Uh, this one is a lot simpler to program. And it uses, instead of IO Link, uh, there's a specific program called UltraProg IR that will give you a lot of expanded parameter access. Uh, so you can change things like we discussed earlier with the uh, the sampling and the response time and things like that. Um, but very nice software, very easy to use. Um, and again, come to our intermediate and advanced trainings and you'll learn all about that stuff. Uh, but this type of uh, product, it's dual PNP switch point. It's not push pull. So only PNP, but you get two switch point outputs on the switch point type. And then uh, there's an analog current and an analog voltage model separate that have uh, switch point outputs as well. And to keep that, you know, keep in mind, we've got up top of that first bullet, 30 new models, whereas the series I.O., there's only eight. So one of the reasons there's 30 models is because you have a separate current and separate voltage version. And also you have these models with the remote transducers and the pivoting heads. Uh, so you can see those heads on the upper right hand corner that kind of angle and pivot those are really nice for customers optimizing their alignment to the target and those are not available in the series IO this is just a, a series 70 item so that concludes the uh, the overview of some of the basic models we have in our cylindrical design the 12 18 and 30 millimeter diameter versions uh, now we're going to discuss some of the surface mount or the rectangular products. Again, moving from smallest sensing range to largest. Uh, the F77 series is our least expensive ultrasonic sensor. Uh, it's also got some nice high-end features and it's also our smallest. So this is kind of like a miniature matchbox housing that gives you switch point and continuous outputs. It's also in the same housing as our ML7 photo eye. So if a photo eye like an ML7 has issues with target color, reflectivity, uh, the beam's too focused, needs a wider beam, uh, a sensor like this, tiny little sensor, can fit right in the same area as a uh, ML7 photo eye and do the job. Okay, so in the, keeping in, in uh, stride with our discussion on smallest to largest, let's go straight to the largest. Uh, the largest surface mount our largest range surface mount product that Pepperell and Fuchs offers for ultrasonics is the F260 series. Uh, this offers a 34 foot sensing range and it gives you independent analog and dual switch point outputs both in the same uh, housing. A very high accuracy and it's a very rugged design so it's tough to get a feel with in looking at that picture as to the size of it. Uh, but it weighs roughly four pounds and it's around six inches diameter, seven inches diameter. Um, so it's very, very large product. And uh, made for uh, large, you know, outdoor applications, looking at deep, very deep, very wide bins, things like that. And maybe we'll see in a short bit some of the applications for it. The next sensor to discuss is our cube housing. This is a compact housing with, again, very high visibility LEDs on each corner of the uh, bottom and the top rear of the sensing face. So very nice if you're at a distance away and you want to know what the status of the sensor is. You can see it, you know, if it's mounted up high on top of a tank, you can see it from the floor level. Uh, the sensing head can uh, rotate in any of five different positions, which is very nice. You can put, program it via the push buttons or a uh, packedware. 
uh, NPN and PNP models, also analog and current model, uh, analog uh, current and voltage models. And it offers a retroreflective mode, which is kind of nice for detection of irregularly shaped objects. So we've kind of gone over the uh, the basic models of switch point, analog output, cylindrical housings, and surface mount housings. But there's a lot of other technologies and capabilities for ultrasonic sensors uh, than just those simple uh, rudimentary designs. Uh, one is a double sheet detection. So if you're in a, uh, a paper feeding application, you want to know if there's a misfeed where two pieces of paper get fed through. Uh, you can do that with a special ultrasonic through beam model. Likewise, on a big paper roll, if there's a splice, you need to detect that splice and cut it out so it doesn't go into your finished product. That's something you can do ultrasonically as well with a special device. Uh, we also have versions that are high pressure washdown immune uh, that can be used in food and beverage applications where there's high pressure cleaners and sanitizers and things. Uh, there's also chemically resistant models if you're you know, perhaps in a semiconductor environment where there's caustic acids and things that you know are made to eat away metal on circuit boards. Uh, we have Teflon coated transducers and chemically resistant models for those environments. And also there's hazardous location models. So there's special models designed for use in areas where there might be uh, combustible gases or dust uh, uh, in, the, in the area. Okay, this is going now to uh, section five of our basic training for ultrasonics. And this is a quick look at application solving accessories. Uh, so we have right angle deflectors that will reduce the sensor mounting profile. So you can see on, <clears throat> I guess, middle left, uh, if you thread a sensor through the through hole there and mount it, the sensor sound uh, can go from the transducer and bank off that 45 degree angle and then go out to look at a target. So you can get kind of a periscope effect uh, with your ultrasonic sensor. Uh, there's also the push button programming tools that we discussed earlier. I saw that UB Prog 2 that can be used with the cylindrical models. Uh, there's various alignment aids and brackets and digital displays even. So quite a few different uh, accessories are available to make ultrasonics even more uh, applicable uh, for sensing applications. Now we go into our sixth and uh, final section a little bit about the applications where ultrasonic sensors can be used. You can see in the application on the right uh, there's a sensor mounted beneath this loop of uh, sheet metal and that height of the sheet metal in in, uh, with respect to the sensing area, how high, how low it is, is directly proportional to the tension on that feed. So you want the optimum amount of tension uh, that you don't pull too hard or have it too loose and things sag. You want a nice level of tension for stamping consistent parts. So the feedback from the ultrasonic sensor, this is an analog model, ensured that you got proper feed tension and you could adjust on the fly if things get a little too tight, a little too slack. Uh, that's what the sensor does is it al allows the controller to know that and adjust. Uh, the environment was originally uh, going to be for a photo eye. You can see that down, you see a sensor mounted in that right angle bracket, that's an ultrasonic, and then to the right of it is a uh, photo eye. But the oils and the dirt that came off of the, uh, the sheet metal caused problems for the photo eye. It just got the, the oh, you were constantly cleaning the lens. So the right angle transducer allowed that ultrasonic to fit in that little trough there and basically take up about the same mounting height as the photo I did. So that was roll loop control in a metal stamping application. Another popular ultrasonic application, whether it's uh, rolls of paper or rolls of sheet metal, is uh, to get roll diameter feedback so you know when you're getting to the end of your roll. Uh, again, continuous analog feedback is, is preferred and the nice things with the ultrasonic sensors, uh, they aren't uh, affected by paper dust, they aren't aff uh, affected by changing target color. Uh, they're, you know, I mentioned they're good for sheet metal and in the previous uh, application we said they're good for oils and dirt and dust and contaminants, all that stuff. So they're a great product for roll diameter feedback. 
Well, this is kind of a neat application for an ultrasonic, and this is for a company that uh, makes conveyors that fill giant yards with piles of gravel and crushed asphalt and things like that. And they had originally used a limit switch, a mechanical sensor that hung from the top of the belt. But that sensor got hit with rocks, it stuck, it broke. Uh, it was a pretty violent application. So they decided to try a UC4000 ultrasonic sensor, which gave them, uh, you know, about 15 feet of sensing range that they required. And it was able to look at this gravel, you know, we mentioned before, hard stuff, uh, gravel, things like that are great targets for ultrasonics. And this target, uh, this sensor worked great. And they could tuck it up inside where it was hidden, so it's not going to get hit by rocks and things like that. Uh, so it was just a nice device, and they know once the uh, the level of that stuff that's flying off the conveyor gets so high, it's time to swing that conveyor left or right and start creating a, another pile. So again, nice outdoor application for an ultrasonic, and it replaced a, a mechanical switch. I think the the quintessential application for ultrasonic sensors is level control. So you see that in small tanks, big tanks, corn to beer to whatever. Um, this particular tank required, it was a little bit caustic on the inside, so they wanted a Teflon film. So this sensor had a Teflon film, one of our uh, UC2000 sensors, and uh, gave the customer continuous level feedback, and it's fitted into a flange that goes into the top of the tank. Here's an application I alluded to a little bit earlier, uh, but it's for ultrasonics on a crop sprayer. So as uh, crops are needing to be fertilized or watered, uh, pesticides applied, things like that, uh, you know, not all of the surfaces of the ground or the contours of the ground are smooth. You know, you'll see plenty of corn and things like that planted in areas where maybe they're on the side of a, a mountain or something like that, a side of a hill. Uh, so as these sprayers go out, you don't want them running into the hill. So these sensors will sense the top of the crop, some of them will sense the ground, and they will move the arms automatically up and down so that there's no collisions. And also to make sure that there's an even spray applied to the whole area. It's not concentrated on one spot uh, because the, the boom may be too low. Uh, it also is very nice because it optimizes the, the production of the farmer because he can fly without having to manually look and lift and move stuff. The sensors take care of all that. So he's, uh, he's able to finish his job quicker because the sensors will take care of a lot of what he used to do by just having to use his eyes and manually shift the booms up and down. Crane position feedback in these big open areas, like th this particular crane is picking up rocks and dumping them, and you get giant plumes of dust that come up. Uh, areas like that, if you want to position the crane as it moves back and forth, is very difficult to do uh, with a photo eye. You know, the area is just way too dusty. So uh, this is something, again, I think this application was solved with one of the F260 devices. Uh, but it just lets you know as the crane, you can do level control with it if you want to see if the, the levels of the aggr aggregate below. But it's more for the cranes going... Uh, forwards and backwards along those tracks as they pick up and dump off the uh, crushed stones. Uh, looking at the level of grains, again another level application, but you can see here the customer, as, as things get dumped from the top, they didn't want the sensor to get beaten up, uh, so they put this protective cover on it, and that allowed the sensor to look through the opening in the bottom to, t to detect the level, but not get pelted by the things that are dropping from above. Another application that's great for ultrasonics is the monitoring of wood chips, whether it's the height of the pile or just the presence of them on a conveyor. Uh, wood chips can be of dramatically different colors, uh, uh, wetnesses, they can be very dusty, you know, the environments, this, the target surface can be slanted and you know, piles are flat, so all of that stuff plays into ultrasonics being a, a perfect sensor uh, to detect and uh, monitor levels and positions of wood chips. On forklifts, um, you want to have something that you can tuck nicely inside the framing of a forklift. If you want to look and see if a pallet is present or if the forks are fully inserted into that pallet, 
Um, so an ultrasonic can gauge that distance from the pallet, um, from the forklift to the pallet. And that t nice little cube style housing uh, tucks nicely in there. It doesn't have nearly the depth that a, a mounting depth of a cylindrical. So that's uh, an application where the the rectangular style or surface mount style is a big benefit over a cylindrical. Okay, we'll come to a near completion of our application section here. Uh, this is another application where being like the forklift, where that cube housing can nicely kind of tuck in inside something. Here, uh, this is a garbage can, residential garbage can pickup application where the sensor will detect with dual switch point. It can tell those claws, okay, you're getting close to the garbage can. Okay, now you're, it's in the window where you can close to pick it up, lift, and dump the contents. So again, the space-saving cube design is really nice for uh, an ultrasonic sensor.